Hello everyone and welcome to the Fire and Flower Holdings Corp. Second quarter fiscal 2021 financial and operational results call. My name is Daisy and I'll be coordinating today's call. You will have the opportunity to ask a question at the end of the presentation. If you'd like to register a question, please press star followed by one on your telephone keypads. I'll now hand over to your host, Trevor Fencott, the CEO of Fire and Flower Holdings to begin. So Trevor, please go ahead. Thank you very much, and thank you for joining me today on our second quarter 2021 conference call. I'm Trevor Fancott, President and CEO of Fire and Flower, and joining me today is Judy Adam, our CFO, and Nadia Vadavaz, our COO. Earlier today, our company published its operational and financial results for the second quarter ended July 31st, 2021, and the results are available on the company's website and on CDAR. Prior to beginning our call, I'll direct listeners to the cautionary statement regarding forward-looking information published on the news release for the first quarter, second quarter, as well as the company's filings on CDAR. Similar to previous earnings conference calls, we'll be providing commentary on our fiscal second quarter 2021 financial results, along with an operational update on our tech-enabled retail business model and the steps we've taken to advance key industry partnerships and secure strategic acquisitions through our newly implemented expanded digital strategy. We focus this quarter on strategically leveraging our proprietary data-driven retail platform, HiFire, to drive near and long-term financial growth for Fire and Flower while helping to transform the cannabis retail experience for the industry at large. We'll then conclude with the moderated question and answer period from equity research analysts that cover Fire and Flower. So first, I'd like to provide an overview of our financial highlights for the second quarter of 2021, as these results demonstrate the strength and continued success of our data-driven retail operations. Our vertically integrated uh, operations, and I'll start with financial highlights, composed of our retail, wholesale, and digital business segments, continue to drive our total revenue performance, resulting in second quarter revenues increasing 51% year-over-year to $43.3 million. Once again, we've delivered another quarter of positive adjusted EBITDA, making this our fifth consecutive quarter, reaching $3.1 million in the second quarter, an increase of 176% compared to Q2 2020. Key to our overall growth is the milestone performance of our digital business, driven by our high-fire digital retail and analytics platform. In the second quarter, this business segment generated $3.7 million representing an increase of 293% from the previous year comparable period. Before diving deeper into the numbers, which Judy will do in a bit, I'd like to review our operational accomplishments in the second quarter and th discuss how we're successfully scaling our unique tech-enabled cannabis retail platform to reach a new level of growth for Fire and Flower and build our leadership position in new markets we strategically enter. So again, here for our operational highlights. Today, we operate 30, 93 stores, sorry, with multiple banner brands, including Friendly Stranger, Hotbox, Happy Days, and Fire and Flower. All of these are powered by our high fire digital retail and analytics platform. While our retail sales have been impacted this quarter by pricing pressure due to an unprecedented number of licenses being issued in Ontario, where we focused much of our retail expansion in Canada, we view this as a temporary industry disruption. Despite our retail sales being slightly down this quarter over quarter, we're more energized than ever by the opportunities we've secured this quarter in expanding our digital footprint to acquire an even stronger data set of customer cannabis purchasing behaviors. As you're aware, we are a technology-first cannabis retailer, and our competitive edge lies in our ability to own and drive value from the customer relationships that we continue to build through our data and analytics technology that's employed in every store we own. And now, every store we enter, either through acquisition or partnership. Our retail strategy is unlike any of our competitors, and as we continue to deploy our digital technology platform across the expanding cannabis retail industry, we're building greater opportunities to generate high-margin revenue growth, and we're more powerfully demonstrating our true competitive edge to drive our leadership position. Our growth this quarter is a direct result of more and more leading cannabis players recognizing the unmatched value of our proprietary data-driven technology and are looking to Fire and Flower as an essential partner for growing their operations. Our longstanding partners have always been key to our growth. Our strategic partner, Alimentacion Couche-Tard, 
supporters of Circle K continue to support our expansion initiatives and exercise their A3 warrants in Q2, increasing their position to 22.4% as we jointly work to advance our co-location pilot program within their Circle K stores. This program, which enables us to open Fire and Flower stores co-located with Pushtar's Circle K stores using their existing real estate, presents an opportunity as we aim to expand across Canada. In this quarter, we've also worked with our partner, American Acres, to drive expansion opportunities across the U.S., targeting key markets like California, Arizona, and Nevada. Through our licensing agreement, American Acres has licensed our Fire and Flower brand, store operating system, and high fire technology platform. We recently announced our entry into the California market with the opening of our first Fire and Flower brand store in Palm Springs, California. In addition, American Acres has officially changed its name to Fire and Flower U.S. Holdings, firmly establishing our U.S. entry strategy and laying the foundation for new Fire and Flower branded U.S. store openings. As part of our licensing agreement, Fire and Flower has an option to acquire American Acres once regulations permit. We believe that we have a unique opportunity to expand in the U.S. by continuing to leverage our high fire technology as we incorporate our platform into each acquired store to strategically advance our overall data-driven retail offering. Finally, in the second quarter, we entered into a strategic supply agreement with Humble and Pume to offer an expanded online catalog of Humble's newest products, including a wide assortment of the most popular cannabis accessories in the world. With the addition of over 5,000 new SKUs, we have further deepened our relationship with our customers by expanding the Spark Perks program to the cannabis accessories to the consumer segment, driving even stronger digital engagement with a broader customer base. Another key facet of this partnership is that it requires little capital investment from our end, as we are able to extend our existing high fire digital retail platform to this high demand line of cannabis accessories and further enhance the e-commerce purchasing experience for our customers. So I'd like to talk a bit about our expanded digital strategy and high fire spark members. We spent significant time building the most comprehensive and insightful cannabis digital retail and analytics platform. And as you can see by our recent results, the strategy is really starting to blossom. Our early investments in the collective work of our leading engineers and data scientists at building our high fire platform is now driving a number of new growth opportunities that focus on commercializing our proprietary technology. With very little capital investment at this stage, we are rapidly building and monetizing the most valuable asset in the cannabis market, customer engagement. As our high fire platform has proven to provide the cannabis industry with the strongest understanding of consumer preferences and behavior, market dynamics to advance the cannabis operations in this very competitive market. With that said, we've successfully accomplished the rollout of our expanded digital strategy. As part of our business strategy, high fire is creating white labeled online dispensaries fulfilled by the Fire and Flower Retail Network that can be expanded to other cannabis dispensaries and delivery channels in both Canada and the U.S. Users of these websites are then enrolled into Fire and Flower's proprietary Spark Perks membership loyalty program, which now has over 310,000 subscribers. Through the continued execution of this digital strategy, we believe we will drive a much larger Spark Perks member base that prevents exponential value to our business. As I continue to emphasize, the most valuable piece of our business and underlying impetus of each of our growth initiatives is the continued advancement and extension of our retail technology platform into new cannabis markets to capture the most valuable piece of the cannabis value chain, owning the customer relationship. Fire and Flowers always place technology first in developing our multi-banner cannabis retail network. Our high fire platform seamlessly connects our customers to achieve the greatest value from each of our stores and presents the unique opportunity to easily integrate this powerful infrastructure into other cannabis operations. We've secured two very important acquisitions in the past month that present another great opportunity to drive our Fire and Flower brand expansion in the U.S., and most importantly, demonstrate our success as a tech-enabled retailer. So recent acquisitions focused on our expanded digital strategy. I want to talk about that for a moment. As we entered the third quarter of 2021, we announced the acquisition of WikiLeaf Technologies, an online cannabis platform that's proven to generate significant user traffic through engaging content and domain name strength. This acquisition officially launched our expanded digital strategy as we will be transforming the WikiLeaf website into a virtual online dispensary for cannabis and accessory products, utilizing the same e-commerce proprietary technology platform that powers our Fire and Flower retail network. 
With this acquisition, we launched a larger dedicated plan to create new branded online dispensaries, white labeling cannabis websites, and rolling users into Fireflower's proprietary Spark Perks membership program. Not only does this digital strategy offer high margin revenue through our high fire platform, it is very asset light and highly scalable as we expand across North America. Following this acquisition, we announced the acquisition of Pop Guide, one of the world's largest cannabis websites and content platforms. Coming right on the cusp of our acquisition of WikiLeaf, this significant opportunity demonstrates the strong growth opportunities that are being created by our newly implemented expanded digital strategy. Even further, this acquisition will provide HiFire with a U.S. base for technology and operations in Denver, Colorado. Once again, the goal here is that we will be able to leverage a significant amount of user traffic by white labeling our dispensary e-commerce software to convert traffic into purchases. Pockeye and WikiLeaf together bring an existing subscriber base of approximately 225,000 cannabis consumers into our Spark Perks ecosystem further strengthening our understanding of cannabis consumer preferences across North America to enhance our overall cannabis retail offering as we expand. Our wholesale division, uh, because we are vertically integrated business in this sense, also supports our continued growth in the face of industry-wide challenges. Our wholesale division operating Saskatchewan open field distribution has maintained and remains a steady source of recurring revenue. We continue to source cannabis products directly from licensed producers in this province to distribute these products to our retail stores and other third-party retailers. This business division has proven successful and supports our overall continued revenue growth. And finally in this, I'd like to provide a NASDAQ update. We continue to progress towards listing on NASDAQ exchange and expect this to be done by the end of this year. While this has been a longer process than we would have liked, it's an exciting one as it presents a great opportunity for Fire and Flower to drive increased visibility of our rapidly expanding business. Now that our high fire tech platform is generating greater interest from the cannabis industry and investors are increasingly recognizing our position as a tech enabled retailer, we believe our listing on the NASDAQ is well suited for our position as a publicly traded company. I'd now like to turn the call over to Judy to discuss our financials and provide a more detailed overview of the progress each of our uh, key businesses have made in the first quarter, of, uh, sort of second quarter of 2021. Judy? Thank you, Trevor, and good morning, everyone. I'm happy to provide a financial overview of Fire and Flower and our operations as released to the markets earlier this morning. To begin, I'll remind everyone that Fire and Flower follows a retail calendar with every quarter consisting of 13 weeks. Today, I will be speaking to the second quarter ending July 31st, 2021. We continue to report quarterly positive adjusted EBITDA with $3.1 million for the second quarter of 2021, representing an increase of 176% compared to positive adjusted EBITDA of $1.1 million in the second quarter of 2020. Our adjusted EBITDA performance continues to be driven by steady revenue growth from all three business segments, continued monetization of our high fire digital retail and analytics platform, and our ability to introduce new cannabis products that specifically meet our target demographics in each of our markets. Total revenue for the second quarter of 2021 increased 51.4% to $43.3 million, compared to $28.6 million in the second quarter of 2020. Fire and Flower's total revenue is derived from three primary business segments. The retail segment, which we had 91 stores as of July 31st, 2021, across Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, British Columbia, and the Yukon Territory. Our wholesale distribution segment, Open Fields Distribution, that sells cannabis and cannabis-related accessories to both fire and flower stores, as well as to external accounts in Saskatchewan. And finally, our digital platform segment, operating through the High Fire Digital Retail and Analytics Platform, proprietary to Fire & Flower. It produces revenue from external clients of the High Fire IT data and analytics platform, as well as industry-leading targeted digital advertising. Of the total revenue of $43.3 million in the second quarter of 2021, retail operations generated $31.8 million Open Fields distribution generated $7.8 million, and $3.7 million came from our high fire digital platform. 
Retail revenues of $31.8 million for the 13 weeks ended July 31, 2021, increased by 36.3% from $23.4 million in the comparable period of 2020. The increase in retail revenue is a result of Fire & Flower's expanded retail network of 91 stores at the end of Q2 2021, compared to 49 stores at the end of Q2 2020. Seven new locations opened in the current quarter, which included two in Ontario, two in British Columbia, two in Manitoba, and one in Saskatchewan. Traditional formats such as flower, particularly in pre-roll and large format value options, and cannabis 2.0 products continue to see top-line growth. On a same-store sales basis, comparing the 48 stores with operations throughout the 13 weeks of Q2 2021 and Q2 2020, sales decreased by 14% year-over-year. This decrease in same-store sales is attributable to the surge in newly licensed retail cannabis stores in Ontario, increasing 48% from 665 at May 1, 2021 to 981 at July 31, 2021, as well as increased competition and aggressive price strategy, pricing strategies by deep discount retailers. Wholesale distribution revenue of $7.8 million for the second quarter of 2021 increased 81.3% from revenue of $4.3 million in the second quarter of 2020. Our wholesale distribution segment operates through our open field business, which purchases cannabis products directly from licensed producer and distributes them directly to our retail stores and other third-party independent licensed retailers in Saskatchewan. Openfield also purchases cannabis accessories and related ancillary products from Canadian-based and global suppliers and dis- distributes them to Fire Flower retail stores and third-party independent retailers in Canada. Revenue in this segment increased as the Saskatchewan market continues to open up and more retailers sor- sourcing inventory from Openfield and growth of cannabis 2.0 products. Digital platform revenue increased 293% to $3.7 million in the second quarter of 2021, from $0.9 million in the second quarter of 2020, as the company continues to monetize the high fire digital retail and analytics platform. The year-over-year increase reflects growing monthly recurring revenues in data sales, both in Canada and the U.S., plus continued maturation of our high fire reach ad network and the initial kickoff of branded digital dispensary partnerships. Total gross profit for the company for the second quarter of 2021 was $16.2 million, or 37.3% of revenue, compared to total gross profit of $10 million, or 34.8% of revenue for the same period of the previous year ended August 1, 2020. All business segments individually contributed to the increase in gross profit dollars. The expansion in gross profit percentage reflects the shift in mix with a larger portion of gross profit coming from the high margin, high fire business in the current period compared to the prior year. Total adjusted EBITDA for the company for the second quarter 2021 was $3.1 million compared to a loss of $1.1 million in the same period of the previous year ended August 1, 2020. All business segments individually delivered positive adjusted EBITDA in the current quarter with high fire leading the way with $2.2 million in adjusted EBITDA. The expansion in gross profit percentage and continued growth in adjusted EBITDA reflects the benefits of being a tech-enabled retailer with a diversified segment portfolio and is a clear testament to our ability to outperform in a highly competitive market. The company reported net income of $19.5 million or earnings per share of $0.06 cents for the second quarter of 2021 compared to a net loss of $42.1 million, or net loss per share of $0.13 cents in a comparable period of 2020. We have a strong balance sheet, and as of July 31, 2021, the company had cash and cash equivalents of $29.3 million and total debt of $3.8 million. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to Trevor and look forward to questions from the participants on the call. Thank you so much, Judy. 
As we move forward to the second half of the year, we continue to build out our asset light model to generate even stronger financial results in the quarters ahead. We will continue to monetize our high fire technology platform and build this technology into our expanding retail network to operate a cannabis retail platform unlike any of our competitors. We look forward to advancing this business strategy that's proven itself advance and lead the cannabis industry. I'd now like to turn the call over to the operator for questions. So over to you, Daisy. Of course. If you would like to register a question, please press star followed by one on your telephone keypad. When preparing to ask your question, please ensure you are unmuted locally. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press star followed by two. So that's star followed by one on your telephone keypad to register a question. Our first question comes from Justin Keywood from Stifle. Justin, your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Just on the gross margins in the quarter, it showed a nice expansion. I think it calculated around 250 beeps, uh, despite the increased competition in the market. I'm just wondering how sustainable these gross margins are. I think actually, Justin, I'm going to kick that over to, we have Nadia on the call. Nadia would probably be the best one to speak to that. Good morning, Justin. Uh, thanks for your question. So if you're talking about um, margin on a consolid base, consolidated basis, certainly um, the margin mix with uh, uh, the really strong performance of the digital platform uh, this quarter has really contributed to an increase in that gross margin, and we expect that to continue. Um, on the retail side, um, we did see uh, a, sort of a tale of different provinces. So uh, Ontario, as it grows, continues to look really strong. Um, certainly in Alberta, we're, we're seeing the price compression from the deep discount competition. And I think that this is, you know, um, we're evolving like we did a couple of years ago when, when the Alberta competition um, really um, was was increasing and we'll see probably some shakeout um, uh, in terms of in terms of margin but there's also opportunities like private label to increase margin so I anticipate that there will be pressures on gross margin and that there'll be opportunities just in on gross margin but what I'm really excited about is the digital platform because we know that that the margin on that business is really strong and as we continue to grow those sales um, particularly in the sales mix, um, that will continue to keep our margins up. Mm -hmm. Understood. Yeah. So, and Justin, that's always been our strategy. We, we started with the end in mind. We knew it was going to be hyper-competitive, which is why we invested in this in 2018 before it was competitive. So now we're starting to see the dividends paid by our digital tech. Absolutely. And on that digital tech, I think I calculated a run rate of about 15 million in annual sales and showed some nice expansion in the quarter. And that was prior to the POT guide and, and WikiLeaf. I'm just wondering if there's any broad goals for where this revenue can trend to. And, and also just on the POT guide and, and WikiLeaf, it, it sounds like there may be some investments uh, required uh, to upgrade that those platforms to uh, the high fire standard and, and if there's uh, an amount uh, attributed uh, for that expected investment. Judy, do you want to handle that one? Sure. Um, yeah, you know, we're, we're really excited about the WikiLeaf and POTS Guide acquisitions um, as, as we already have a significant base of monthly, monthly and annual recurring revenue subscriptions coming out of existing high fire products. Um, you, you'll see that we've, we've been more than doubling year-over-year -year quarterly revenue, um, and as we add new revenue channels and products to the digital platform, this will give us an opportunity to produce more high-margin revenue streams. So, so far this year, High Fire has delivered significant year-over-year -year growth, and, um, yeah, we expect us to see the same trend um, play out for the remainder of the year. Justin, maybe what I'd add to that in terms of color as well is I, I always like to talk about High Fire is not our IT department. People often sort of confuse it with, it's, you've got a lot of SG&A, what is this? Well, it's an R&D arm of the company. It develops and commercializes technology. So it's not even just that one, there's one revenue stream associated with a digital product. Like we keep creating new digital products 
uh, and services and revenue streams as the, as the market matures. It's a dynamic kind of living thing that's creating new revenue streams. So it's not even, you know, WikiLeaf and Pockeyes are just the latest instantiation of our, of our tech R&D. So I think that's important to kind of factor in when you look at how it could grow. Because remember last year this time people were asking questions of, well, how many data and analytics platform, you know, uh, subscriptions can you sell? Well, we've proven that actually we developed an ad network. And now we're, we're, we developed a customer acquisition channel. So that's how I would look at it. Yeah, yeah and, and certainly and would, diversify. Yeah. yeah, and I would just add, again, you know, these are all high margin revenue streams and highly scalable, especially as we expand across North America. Great. And if I could just fit in one more question. Um, in Ontario, the store cap lifting this month from 30 to 75 per operator, what would be the strategy for fire and flower uh, in either buying or building or, or co-locating, assuming the strategy is still uh, to maximize that store cap? So maybe I'll start with this one, and, and uh, Natty and Judy can, can jump in and add some color. But, I mean, obviously Ontario is going to be an important, we always knew it was going to be an important market. In Canada, it's a 14 million person province, so it's important. Um, you know, having said that, you know, we've taken a, a real sort of a careful look at our real estate portfolio. We have a shared service agreement with, you know, Circle K Couchard. So we planned our real estate portfolio well in advance. So as we we're kind of looking to, maximize the cap. I think it's more important that we go into the right locations rather than we sort of run and sprint to just open stores. That's a, that's a very early uh, early stage gameplay, and I think it leads to, um, you know, potentially capital misallocation. So for us, we want to make sure that we obviously want to max out our cap, but we want to do it in a very planful uh, way. The right location is always going to be the right location. So I don't know if there's any other color due to your, Maddie, you want to add to that? Well said, Trevor. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I've what? learned the word planful from, from Nadia. <laughs> okay. I appreciate the additional color. Thank you for taking my questions. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Frederico Gomez from ATB Capital Markets. Frederico, your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning, guys. Uh, uh, just, just to stay on the high fire topic, you know, very strong uh, digital sales growth uh, this quarter. I just wonder if you could maybe just provide more color on, on what's driving that growth. Are, are you getting more customers or is it about upselling existing customers? And, and is that coming mostly from Canada or, or from the U.S.? Thanks. Yeah, so so uh, so return to kind of the idea of of layered revenue stream. So if you look at kind of our last year's results, I believe it was sort of 6.2, 6.3 million in overall uh, digital revenue. The, the bulk of that was recurring data and analytics subscription revenue, but just a, a touch of it was the beginning of our, our um, ad network revenue coming in. And so we continue to kind of layer that on and that continues to grow. And now we're, we're bringing on sort of different customer acquisition and monetization channels. So I would expect it to be almost like a layer cake. You're adding different sort of revenue streams on top of different revenue streams. So the mix isn't going to be completely homogenous anymore as you diversify the product. So with WikiLeaf and Pot Guides, you have this tremendous opportunity to bring in all these customers in a customer acquisition funnel or channel, uh, and then we can push them out to different branded e-commerce uh, websites or into stores, and we'll monetize it all through our sort of tech, tech chain. So, I mean, short answer is that there won't be any one dominant sort of revenue stream as time progresses, which is a good thing for us. That means that we've got a diversified revenue stream. Uh, we are definitely, definitely adding customers, and you see the growth in our Spark Perks membership. And, uh, and as I said, with 225,000 combined, uh, uh, you know, users or members of WikiLeaks and Pot Guides, you can see pretty clearly that you start to aggregate that, you can start to monetize that. And that hasn't even started yet. So, I mean, hopefully that provides some color on kind of where the revenue uh, is coming and the growth will be coming from. The other thing is the opportunities that we're starting to to push down the pipe on that one, including the branded websites. That again, it's just just starting. This is something that is sort of like measured in weeks, not uh, not quarters. So we're excited that we're just at the beginning of that process. 
I appreciate that, Trevor. Uh, that, that's very helpful. And and maybe if you could comment on our pipeline for further M and A on the digital side, you know, uh, are, are you looking at uh, different companies to to build their tech stack further? You know, just how's the pipeline looking there? Yeah, I mean, and that's a that's a great question because because we with the pot guide and WikiLeaf acquisition, we are the only company that we're aware of actually that has a fully vertical, fully integrated, complete vertical stack from customer acquisition to customer management to digital uh, modalities like e-commerce, things like delivery. So all the way from the beginning to the end, we have this complete vertical stack. So it sort of completed our tech stack, so to speak, and we're the only one um, that, that has these capabilities at the moment, although it's relatively slim, it's complete. So I would expect us to be looking at, at ways to increase things like customer uh, acquisition channels, customer count, because that's ultimately what's going to drive value. We will always be looking for um, valuable acquisitions in the space. There's a lot of sort of uh, smaller tech offerings that, 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 that are out there that we will continue to evaluate. Uh, and we're always sort of interested in growth, but it's got to be appropriate growth. We're not interested in, in overpriced acquisitions. We're not interested in things that are uh, duplicative. It has to really uh, pass a, a pretty rigorous internal test before we would proceed with things. But we are looking for growth. Thank you. I appreciate that, Trevor. Uh, hop back to the queue. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from Andrew Semple from Echelon Wealth Partners. Andrew, your line is open. Please go ahead. Hello. Good morning. Um, first good question morning. from me uh, is just on the revenues, uh, the retail part of the business. Um, obviously, retail revenues may face some pressures with COVID-19 lockdowns during uh, during the this quarter. Um, could you maybe provide some insight as to whether and to what magnitude we should expecting those retail um, uh, sales per store to recover into Q3 um, as we move past uh, some of the lockdowns we experienced uh, in the prior quarter. Sure. So maybe I'll start that one off. I'm sure that you're going to uh, get color from, from from all three of us on this one because it's something that uh, is very topical for us. But at a high level, the metaphor is we're kind of in this trifecta or perfect storm of three different sort of competing uh, factors. You've got COVID, which continues to sort of weigh on the industry um, and the you know regulatory uncertainty. Things like buildouts are, are still stalled out in some some cases. You still have reduced foot traffic. Um, you know it hasn't returned to pre-COVID levels. We're in a fourth wave. There's all that sort of stuff. You've also got uh, you've also got licensing expansion, which again a, a nearly 50% expansion in one quarter in uh, the major a major market is nothing to sneeze at, so that's going to happen. But again, these are nothing, these are things that we faced in Alberta before. And then I think you've got the third uh, pressure pillar of, you know, uh, predatory price, price, uh, the price wars happening for the deep discount uh, retailers. So you've got these three things, all of these three things have an end to them. Uh, you know, do I think it's Q3? Well, I, I think that that's unlikely. These things are going to resolve themselves over time because of course you can't on the deep discount front there has to be a sustainable business model underneath it. You can disrupt for a little while, but eventually economic sense has to prevail because you have to operate a business that makes money. Uh, on the COVID side, of course, COVID, uh, you know, knock on wood, COVID has to, to end at some sort of juncture, but we've been hearing predictions on when that's going to happen for, for over a year now. And then, of course, on the licensing frontier, you quite naturally, like this is just a normal part of the business cycle. We saw it in Alberta where there was a mass licensing I think the record at the time was 20 licenses a week, and it expanded. It's got a lot of kind of mom and pops in the queue that, and unfortunately, even though there isn't really a lot of room for, for single players anymore in the market, they have to kind of launch to the market because they've signed a lease, and uh, so they're coming. Come, uh, you know, no matter what, they're going to launch. And then you got the overcrowding and then a pairing back uh, as, as businesses, unfortunately, uh, can't, can't compete. So. All these things resolve themselves. I doubt they resolve themselves in a quarter, um, but they eventually do. So I pass it off to my, my colleagues to see if there's another perspective they want to, or some color they want to add. Trevor, I think you're on a roll today. You don't leave me any. You don't leave me anything else to say. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. I'll be more uh, flexible next time. We'll, we'll start with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that was very helpful, Trevor. Thank you. Um, you know, just on the, you know, one of the points you brought up, um, I did want to explore your team's value segment of the markets, which, you know, as you guys know, and as I'm sure you've seen your high fire data, you know, is coming on quite strong. Um, could you maybe speak to whether Fire and Flower has a strategy or a plan to unveil a strategy on how, you know, the company plans to address um, the value segment of the market and, you know, potentially looking at more aggressive pricing strategies um, within your retail portfolio? So this one I am going to hand to Nadia because she's, she's obviously very close to this, but I, but I would just point out one thing before, which is there's a difference. It's important to understand the difference between a value strategy, which is giving the consumer what they want at the price they want, and it's a certain type of consumer, which we're very plugged into because, of course, we're a data-driven retailer. A value strategy is different than category um, discounting, which is sort of just a blanket discount strategy. That's, that's market disruption, and it is a competitive strategy for a while. But, you know, again, just blanket discounting to disrupt the market is not a value strategy. So it's an important kind of distinction that, that, that I think people uh, need to keep in mind. And then with that, I'll, I'll leave to Nadia, who will explain how we look at it. Thank you. Good morning, Andrew. Uh, so this is exciting uh, in retail because we are now seeing the emergence of the various types of consumers and how they like to shop uh, and in what brands. So we, in fact, in the middle uh, of the quarter, Andrew, launched a value proposition to our customers. And we know that there is a value segment uh, of our customer base that shops in our store and they need to have compelling product. Uh, and the appropriate assortment priced in the way that is compelling to them. And it was highly effective. And so we will continue to expand that within our current stores uh, so that those customers are always compelled to come to us. And then we can also offer them other choices while they're in shop um, with our Kinistas. Um, there is a, uh, within our portfolio, uh, a few of our stores, particularly in the Happy Days locations, that are more of a value-based offering, and those are also highly successful stores. I think it's fair to say that we will explore that in a meaningful way in the uh, quarters to come for sure. Great. That's helpful. Thank you, Nadia. Um, and one last question, if I may. Um, you know, I did want to ask on High Fire, there, there's another great step up this quarter in terms of commercializing, uh, you know, the hard work that goes into that, uh, that ecosystem. Um, how should we be thinking about digital revenues in the back half of the year? You know, it, it, if we look back to Q4 of last year, we did see a bump around the holiday period. Would you expect that to, to reoccur um, in, in this upcoming holiday period? Um, and then more generally, you know, how, how do you think the pace of the, that business is building um, towards the second half? So maybe I'll start that one as well and pass it to, to, to Judy. But I, I think that it still goes back to that kind of layered um, product assortment or layered revenue stream assortment this year versus last year. So last year, as I said, most of that 6.3 or 6.2 was comprised of, um, you know, digital analytics uh, you know, a data package sort of with subscription, recurring subscription revenue, and that some of that is to do with subscription timing, right, sort of renewals and that kind of thing. So, so you know, that that's part of that business. I would say the difference this year is we have, you know, our digital uh, advertising uh, network. We've got these other sort of uh, revenue streams sort of layering on top of that. So it's going to be, as I said, a, a lot less homogenous, a lot more um, layered and kind of nuanced. But that's just to keep having these sort of growth drivers layered on top to continue having it grow. So, you know, um, in terms of Lumpy, we have other different streams that are that are layered on top of it. But, you know, Judy, do you have any other color you want to add to that kind of general framework? Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, the only thing I'd add is, uh, as Trevor said, in, in Q4 last year, we really just started to launch that uh, the, the high fire reach ad network. So we're seeing maturation in that now, um, and we continue to 
see, you know, a growing monthly recurring revenue stream in de data sales, both from Canada and U.S. Um, so things have started to really kind of, you know, steady out. Um, um, and, and, you know, we're also seeing an initial kickoff of revenues coming from um, the, the branded digital dis dispensary partnerships. Um, so when you look at the front half performance, uh, with a doubling of revenues year over year. I mean, we, you know, we really expect that trend to kind of continue into the back half. That's very helpful. Thank you, Trevor and Judy, uh, and uh, I'll hop back into you. Congrats again on the quarter. Thanks. Our next question comes from Aaron Gray from Allianz Global Partners. Aaron, your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, and thank you for the questions. <clears throat> um, first one for me, uh, you know, Trevor, you kind of spoke to, you know, potential other acquisitions, you know, down the line on the technology side, um, always looking for more acquisitions in the space. So we'd love to get your thoughts in terms of, you know, where you feel you guys are right now, you know, the recent um, WikiLeaf and Pot Guy acquisition, and just how you're seeing the overall landscape. You, you talked a little about, you know, valuations are still a little bit frothy. Uh, we've seen some other, you know, competitors on that side of technology um, continue to announce other acquisitions. So could you maybe just give some color in terms of what you're seeing out there, you know, in terms of the prices and, and maybe the pipeline, if you think that's more of a near-term dynamic in terms of more acquisitions, or you're kind of focused on integrating some of the recent acquisitions you've had today um, and maybe incremental acquisitions, acquisitions down the line. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question because, again, it comes down to the idea that we we our first, our first acquisition was High Fire back in 2018. And so think of it as a team of, like, 25 26 data scientists and engineers that are building things for us. And so it will, you know, as you know, in business, it's always sort of well, it's often cheaper to build things yourself if you started the right way and you build it to be scalable and extensible. If you're buying something, um, unless it's, it's distressed or massively undervalued, you sort of you're taking on some of their uh, development costs in that purchase price. So we really take a keen focus on what do we need to build or what can we expand uh, and what can we do ourselves, because that is, is very cost effective, and what do we need to go out uh, to augment, and what gets us farther faster on that on that front. So we started off with a very robust, um, I'm going to call it like a technical spine, or the building blocks being very, very solid. So when we add things like WikiLeaf is an is a easy add for us, because we have that, that bend strength to integrate it. So we're going to focus, obviously, on pot guide integration and WikiLeaf integration and commercialization in the kind of, you know, obviously immediate term. I would say that in the technical landscape, and yes, we agree that valuations are extremely frothy uh, out there on the tech side. Uh, we are uh, hopeful that people, investors, will start to recognize that we actually have, are the only ones with a complete vertical, uh, you know, tech stack in the, in the cannabis industry. I think a lot of the acquisitions uh, in the outside tech industry are going to be focused on actually, you know, creating a vertical stack for themselves, right? If there's missing pieces. So analogs to all the pieces of our technical stack, whether it's customer acquisition, you know, or customer management, loyalty, or e-commerce, or all the things that we already have in a, you know, in our stack, I think that that's probably where the M&A outside will, will look at as they try to fill in missing pieces of their technology. With us, we have a complete technology. The technology is complete. It's the only complete vertical, uh, certainly that we're aware of the cannabis thing. So for us, it's a little different when we look at acquisitions. It is what's going to get us further faster and what's going to leverage our existing engineering uh, and technology base. This is all stuff that we've largely built, right? So, um, you know, and hopefully that explains a little bit of how we look at acquisitions. It's not simply sort of a, you know, going out in an M&A frenzy, that's sort of good for anyone, but but measured, planful kind of what gets us farther faster are things that we would look at. Uh, that's really helpful, Carlos. Thank you for that. And, and my second question will kind of be a follow-on to that. Uh, number one, I just could you provide some more color in terms of, you know, how, you know, you guys are currently um, have the vertical tech platform and you, you mentioned kind of some of your competitors maybe looking to go out and become similar. You know, what do you see as maybe the difficulty um, in you already having it on a legacy basis and already having that expertise versus them trying to go out and acquire it? Maybe the 
difficulties in terms of um, being able to integrate that. And then secondly, you know, just in terms of what area, you know, the, the technological, you know, supply chain you believe would be um, most valuable maybe today to, that gets you further faster, as you mentioned before, just to maybe think about you know, more clearly might with, within that, that pipeline in terms of the different verticals of the supply chain for technology might be looking. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, there's a lot in there, but I could I can unpack it. The, the, I think that the for us the most valuable part of the chain is is owning the customer uh, relationship because it's the job of a retailer is like that's your job. If you can't own the customer uh, relationship, then it, you know in some way you've lost it. And each time you have a piece of technology from the outside, a third party technology that you are integrating into your operations, you've lost control in varying degrees to that relationship. So if you're using third party e-commerce as a retailer, you've lost you know control over that customer relationship. If you're using third party uh, loyalty, customer loyalty um, services, then you've definitely lost the relationship with that customer. You know, if you're using third party delivery, all these sort of things matter. And so for us it's driven on the fundamental premise of own the customer relationship. That's what you have to do. And I would sort of say the difference between what we're doing and what I think the general technology environment in cannabis outside is doing is we are based in a retail environment, and that was that was by design. So what we do and the way that we develop our technology is we are a retailer. So the use cases, the technology development protocols, what we need to develop comes from ourselves. We are beta testing on ourselves. So we are able to have a feedback loop between what is uh, advantageous at retail to what we should develop and, and deploy almost instantaneously. It's a very, very small feedback loops as, as opposed to a third party software provider, which is, well, you know, we'll get to it when, you know, it suits our development pro you know, process or, uh, our, you know, our staffing resources. A great example was when COVID hit, to be quite honest, we didn't have in our development pipeline, um, you know, fast, you know, spark first fast lane, like the kind of click and collect functionality. Uh, and so we very, very quickly, of course, adapted that. We built it, and it was done and deployed. Things like um, things like early on with Spark Perks, being able to message, if you recall in Canada, there was a lot of uh, product disruption in the beginning. So there wasn't product availability was a big issue. So we, of course, accelerated in Spark Perks the ability to notify our Spark Perks members that, hey, your product is in. You're not going to come to a store and, and be met with the with that product. We'll notify you. You can come pick it up. We'll factor we'll reserve it for you, we'll hold it for you. So that I think is a kind of key difference between what we're doing using the retail platform as a necessary part of that development uh, feedback loop versus what's happening on the outside. Does that make sense? No, it does. And that was uh, really helpful to provide that detail. So appreciate that helpful caller. And I'll go ahead and jump back in the queue. All right, thanks. If anyone would like to register a further question, please press star followed by one on your telephone keypad. We have no further questions at this point, so I'll hand back over to the team. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to speaking with you again next quarter. Uh, and please watch the press releases. Lots of stuff going on. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for joining today's call. You may now disconnect your lines.